In the summer of 1992, an 18-year-old woman is murdered so mercilessly that police launch an investigation believing that their culprit is a fully grown man. It would take several years for this case to be solved and police were astounded to find that their callous killer was a 12-year-old child. Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another True Crime Case. If you're new here, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. If you've watched one of my videos before, thank you for coming back and sitting and listening to another one with me. I really appreciate your continuing support. If you're interested in true crime, please make sure to subscribe and to click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new True Crime Case. Before listening to today's video, please check the description box below law for any trigger warnings. Today I'm going to be telling you all about a young girl who was dubbed the devil's daughter and who was Britain's youngest female murderer. This is the case of Sharon Carr. Sharon Louise Carr was born on the 21st of December 1979. She is one of four children to an abusive alcoholic father and an equally abusive mother named Molly. The family lived in Belize, which is on the northeast coast of Central America, and where they lived was quite poverty stricken. The family, like most other people in their community, were extremely poor. They lived in really small houses and often went long periods of time without food. As you can imagine, this caused a lot of tension in the family home and more often than not, Sharon's parents would be arguing and fighting and most of the time the children would get the backlash off of this. It wasn't unusual for the children to receive regular beatings from their dad or from Molly. Molly, however, would take the abuse to a whole other level. For example, when disciplining the children, she would either burn them or she would put hot pepper on their genitals. So living in these conditions was obviously traumatizing and horrible for the children. They essentially had to raise themselves, they had to fend for themselves, and they lived on high alert every single day, probably in a lot of fear. Molly ended up leaving her husband or partner, whatever he was, when she met an English man named George. George worked for the British Army and he was stationed in Belize, so this is how he and Molly crossed paths. They began a relationship and when George's time in Belize was done and he was ready to go back to England, Molly saw this as a really good opportunity for a better life so she packed everything up and she made the move with George. She did bring Sharon along with her who at the time was seven. I couldn't find if she had brought any of her other children, whether she left them in Belize or if they made the move with her. They weren't really mentioned again at all. Molly, George and Sharon all settled in Camberley, Surrey in 1986 and initially Sharon really struggled to adjust to this new life and it was a real culture shock for her but at the same time she was doing really well. She began attending Cornwallis Junior School where teachers would describe her as being kind, polite and helpful. She had fun playing basketball and she managed to get herself into a nice little friendship group and her friends would describe her as a very nice social person. Her home life though didn't massively change, she would still win witness a lot of domestic violence and she sort of grew a tolerance of it. It didn't really affect her, it was just a normal part of her everyday life. Not too long after their move to England, George decided that he was over this relationship with Molly. He said that he was sick of the drama and it's probably safe to assume that she was abusive towards him, like how she was to her partner back in Belize. Determined to end their relationship, George went over to Molly's house and told her that he didn't want to be with her anymore. And upon hearing this, Molly filled with rage, she was infuriated. So she marched to the kitchen, got a big pot of boiling cooking fat and doused George in it. Sharon stood in clear view. She watched all this happen from start to finish and George recalled that she had no emotion towards it whatsoever. She wasn't scared, she didn't cry, she didn't even flinch. He was rushed to the hospital to be treated for his serious burn injuries and back at the house, Molly was arrested and charged with assault. At Guildford Crown Court, she was handed a suspended sentence with the condition that she had to attend three years of therapy. 
therapy. A suspended sentence means that she doesn't have to spend any time in prison but she does have a set of rules that she has to follow and her therapy attendance is one of those rules. At some point and I don't know exactly when but Molly introduced Sharon into practicing voodoo so this would include Sharon participating in animal sacrifices, being taught how to recite rituals which would give her complete control over the person she's putting the spell on and rituals that would cause harm to others. It's believed that this is where Sharon began developing a fixation on death and on killing through these animal sacrifices. Rapidly all of the pets in the street started disappearing or turning up dead. Sharon even took responsibility for decapitating a dog with a spade and she just thought this was great. The people in the street kind of knew that it was Sharon that was making their pets disappear and killing them but at this point in time Sharon had a reputation she was very feared by a lot of people so nothing was really done about it. Sharon in primary school and Sharon in secondary school were two completely different people. She had started knocking around with a really bad crowd mostly made up of boys that were much older than her and were a really bad influence. She began to shoplift, she would carry a knife around with her at all times even when going to school. She would buy and sell drugs and at the age of 11 she was using cannabis. Using and abusing any sort of drugs especially at such a young age like that can have a detrimental effect on the brain's development and that is something that we will circle back to later. Sharon's behaviour rapidly started to decline. She became disruptive, she was violent and aggressive and she had a real problem with authority figures. Because of these behaviours her head teacher at Collingwood College Comprehensive School made a report to social services. In 1990 following this report Sharon was removed from Molly's care, she was removed from her home but that only lasted a month before she was placed back with Molly. So she is now officially on social services radar. I don't know where Molly was or what Molly was doing through this period of time. What I do know is that she'd found a new boyfriend and she moved him into the house so this probably started up a whole other cycle of tension and of domestic violence that Sharon had to witness. Katie Ratcliffe was an 18 year old woman from Hawley, Surrey. She came from a really loving, happy family and she had a relatively normal, happy upbringing. Katie was one of these people who just knew what she wanted in life. She knew what she wanted to do, what direction she was going in and she started working hard in order to get there. She began working as an apprentice hairdresser in her local salon and for her this was the first step of achieving her dream of one day owning her own salon. She really thrived there, she was talented, she was chatty, all the clients really liked her, she was super popular and she was building up her own steady clientele. It seemed for Katie that everything was just going perfectly in life and at this moment in time she couldn't have been happier. That was until late May 1992 when her boyfriend, a man named Martin Mustafa, broke up with her. Katie's heart absolutely shattered when Martin broke up with her. She was head over heels in love with this man. This was the man she saw a future with, the man she wanted to marry and have a family with and now it's all come to an end. This sent Katie into a bit of a depressive episode. She sparsely left the house, only really leaving the house to go to work at the salon where everyone here noticed the change in her mood. After a couple of weeks of this, Katie's friends decided that enough was enough and after some persuasion they managed to convince Katie to join them on a night out to forget about Martin, to let her hair down and for her to just have some fun with her friends. On the 6th of June 1992 sporting a white crop top, navy trousers, ankle boots and a blue jacket Katie was ready for a night of fun. Her and her friends all made their way to a nightclub in Camberley which was called Ragamuffins. All night the girls sang, they danced, they got drunk and they were just having an amazing time and Matten was at the back of Katie's mind 
up until she caught him out the corner of her eye. She done what I think every recently split up girlfriend does when they're drunk, they wanna be back with their boyfriend and sees them on a night out. She went up to him and started pouring her heart out to him, expressing that she loved him, that she missed him, that she wanted to make this work, that she really, really just wanted to get back together and go back to how they were, but Martin was having none of it. Katie was persistent and she kept on trying until Martin just turned to her and said no and that he had a new girlfriend. I think we can all imagine how devastated Katie would have felt in that moment. She asked him one final question, would he please just take her home? And when he said no, she turned around and stormed out of ragamuffins, going to make her way home alone. Sharon, who at this point in time is 12 years old, would often hang around ragamuffins and just kind of linger around the area. So it's now the 7th of June, it's around four in the morning and Sharon is out in a car with two much older boys. I don't exactly know how much older they are, but I think if Sharon's 12 and they're old enough to be driving, they've got no business hanging around together. Sharon and these boys then spot Katie who has just stormed out of the club and she's clearly distressed and looks as though she's making her way home. So they pull over, they ask her if she wants a lift and Katie who has just had the worst ending to her night, she's drunk, she's tired, she does just want to get home, accepts the offer and climbs into the car. She probably felt a lot safer knowing that there was a child in the car with these two boys. The person driving is just kind of cruising around the streets and Katie notices that he's not going in the direction of her house, he's actually going in the opposite direction towards somewhere called Farnborough. He drives and pulls up to this very dark, desolate, isolated kind of parky area and Katie becomes overwhelmed with panic and fear. She's got a gut instinct that something isn't right so she bolts out of the car and starts sprinting away from Sharon and the boys. Sharon, who has armed herself with a knife, starts chasing after Katie. She very quickly catches up and begins to stab Katie in the back using this six and a half inch knife. After she drops to the ground, Sharon viciously and uncontrollably continues to stab Katie, some of the stabs being so vicious and ferocious that they actually go right through Katie. Sharon continues this attack on Katie even when it's clear that she is already died, she is enjoying committing this murder. She proceeded to mutilate her, slashing at Katie's face, breasts and intimate areas. In total, Katie sustained 32 separate injuries at the hands of this 12 year old girl who was a complete stranger. Katie's blood soaked half naked body is then dragged to a nearby cemetery wall. She sort of slumped up against it and then just left. A couple of hours later in the early morning, a group of four young boys who had just spent the night camping and were now on an early morning walk found the body of Katie. Police were notified and eventually Katie's parents were able to verify that this body was that of their 18 year old daughter. A murder investigation quickly began and naturally one of the first people that officers wanted to speak to was Matten, Katie's ex-boyfriend. Usually when a woman is murdered, it's more likely to be from someone that she knows, more often partners. The 2020 census showed that in 2020, 110 women were murdered by men. 52% of these murders were committed by either the woman's current or former partner, whereas only 8% of the murders were committed by strangers. So it's safe to say that majority of the time, it is the partner. When Martin found out that Katie had been murdered, he sort of broke down, he was devastated, he was hysterical, he was regretful, saying to the police, quote, if only I had taken Katie home, she would be alive today, that will haunt me for the rest of my life. He was shortly after eliminated as a suspect. 
police done a press release asking anyone who had been in or around ragamuffins on that night to come forward if they had any information if they had seen katie if they'd seen her leave with anyone anything suspicious kind of anything like that they did get a few leads from this but none of them aided in actually solving the case something that stuck with investigators that really stood out that really got them thinking was where katie was found like i said she was found in farnborough which was the opposite direction of our home and she wasn't known to have any business down there nor friends or anything like that so this was a big question mark for investigators they were thinking could she have went home with someone and maybe they've committed the murder investigators began making a criminal profile on who they believed their killer was based off of the crime so they determined that they were looking for a man in sort of his early 30s he had to have had a strong build maybe he enjoyed going to the gym they believed the killer had to be someone who was insanely strong in order to inflict these wounds because they were so ferocious and they also had to overpower katie as well the wounds also told investigators that the person who committed this crime really enjoy doing it and try to prolong it as much as possible some of katie's wounds were really really deep stabs and several of them were slashes where the killer wanted to continue inflicting pain wanted to prolong the murder because they were enjoying it so much and they also believed that the motive for this murder was some sort of sexual motive because of katie's intimate areas being mutilated they came up with this profile along with this photo fit and they broadcasted it everywhere and they sort of got tunnel vision they were determined to find this man sadly despite their best efforts following every lead every tip investigating every single suspect and everything else they got no closer to solving katie's murder and sadly the case began to go cold over the next two years sharon would write entries in her diary detailing what she had done talking about the murder relishing in it and talking about her arousal from it as well in one of her entries she wrote quote i bring the knife into her chest her eyes are closing she is pleading with me so i bring the knife to her again and again i don't want to hurt her but i do need to do violence to her i need to overcome her beauty her serenity her security there i see her face when she died I know she feels her life slowly being drawn from her and I hear her gasp. I guess she was trying to breathe. If only I could kill you again, I promise I would, and you suffer more this time, you effing slag. Your terrified screams turn me on, and much more that I will delve into further shortly. As Sharon's diary entries progressed, she became more confident and more graphic in her writing she is well aware that police are looking in the complete wrong direction for katie's killer and she thinks this is hilarious she's getting gratification from this that she is tricking the police the way she was writing and what she was writing about you can tell that she is really trying to relive the whole thing she's chasing that adrenaline rush she's chasing that high that she got when she committed the murder but writing about it is never going to get her close enough to that high that she is craving on the second anniversary of katie's murder on the 7th of june 1994 sharon wrote in her diary about her desire to kill again and how this murder is going to be different this murder would be much more brutal it would last a lot longer so that she could enjoy it more and so that she could listen to the painful screams longer and relish in it and enjoy it this entry wasn't just a fantasy for sharon this was a plan that she had full intentions to carry out so again on this day the 7th of june 1994 the second anniversary of katie's death sharon who was now 14 lured a fellow pupil into the toilets at their school she approached 13 year old Anne marie clifford and told her that she'd lost a pound coin in the toilets and that she needed help finding it again like i mentioned before sharon she's a bully she's not liked and people are scared of her so when she approached Anne-Marie under the rouse of needing help 
Anne-Marie kind of felt like she didn't have an option but to go and follow Sharon into the toilet. She was too scared to refuse. Upon entering the toilet, Sharon pushed Anne-Marie onto the floor. She then towered over her, looking down to Anne-Marie as she's pulling a four inch knife out of her bag. Anne-Marie recalled Sharon laughing, chucking the knife between her hands and seemingly bursting with excitement and in anticipation on what was about to happen. Terrified for her life, Anne-Marie pounced up and tried to make for the door to escape, but Sharon pushed her back down onto the floor, raised her arm and stabbed her in the back. At that exact moment, a group of five girls came into the toilet and this kind of shocked Sharon, she took her back and stopped her from continuing this attack. The single stab wound that Anne-Marie sustained had punctured her lung and she was pouring of blood. She was very quickly rushed to the hospital for life-saving treatment and thankfully she survived this attack. Back at school, Sharon had been arrested and she's now on her way for a psychological assessment but she's still full of adrenaline, she's still on a high from what she had done so when she gets there, she attacks two members of staff by trying to strangle them. She was just far too dangerous, so she was from there transferred to a Young Offenders Institute. In December 1994, after the attack on Anne-Marie and then the attack on the two staff members, Sharon was convicted of actual body harm and was sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. Being detained at Her Majesty's pleasure means there wasn't given like, she didn't get two years, she didn't get a minimum of 10 years, anything like that. She was just going to be held until she was deemed to be safe for release, if that makes sense. For several months, Sharon kind of bounced between psychiatric units. She never stayed anywhere for long because she was always getting into bother, into trouble. She was always involved in instigating fights. In September 1995, she was transferred to Bullwood Hall Young Offenders Institute where they seemed to manage her better. It was while here at Bullwood Hall that staff started to notice that Sharon liked to talk and specifically she seemed to be talking about this years old murder case. She would talk on the phone to friends and family, just very little details. She was never really direct, she just kind of spoke around it. She had also took a fancy and a like into one of the male prison officers and she would sort of speak to him about it as well. She spoke about it so much that the staff became concerned so they contacted the police and relayed all this information onto them. With the little bits that they had picked up from Sharon that they had told the police, the police were able to narrow it down to one of their unsolved cases which was the murder of Katie Ratcliffe. Officers searched Sharon's room and then seized her diary where when they read it, they could not believe the disturbing material that was inside. Inside this diary that Sharon had had for years, I do believe it was the same one that I told you about earlier. So she somehow brought this diary from the outside into the inside. I'm not 100% but I am pretty sure. Anyways, inside here she detailed murdering Katie and the sexual excitement that she got from it. She had drawings of the knife that she used to murder Katie. She would refer herself as the devil, saying, quote, Overnight I see the devil in my dreams, sometimes even in my mirror, but I realise it was just me. She wrote even more disturbing things, such as, quote, I was born to be a murderer. Killing for me is a mass turn on and it just makes me so high I never want to come down. I swear I was born to be a murderer. I'm a killer. Killing is my business and business is good. She talks about Katie's final moments saying quote, the air stops in the back of her throat. I know all of her life her breathing has worked but it does not now and I am joyful. Every year on the anniversary of Katie's murder, Sharon dedicates an entry to Katie. So as I told you earlier, on the second year anniversary, she wrote about her desire to murder again. That's the day she attacked Anne-Marie in school. On the third anniversary, she wrote, quote, killed K.R., the death by knife wounds and sex go together. On the fourth year anniversary, she wrote, quote, respect to Katie Ratcliffe four years ago today. I'm pretty sure that that fourth year anniversary entry as well was wrote after she had been kind of caught and charged for Katie's murder. 
So throughout these whole years, over four years, she has been holding on to this murder, really trying her best to relive it and cling on to it as much as she can. Police needed to interview and speak with Sharon for although the stuff in her diary was disturbing to say the least, it wasn't concrete evidence or it couldn't prove with certainty that she had committed the murder. Honestly, the thought that a 12 year old could have committed such a horrific crime was incredibly unbelievable for the police. Again, back when they were investigating and they were looking for a stocky 30 year old man and here they're being presented with a girl who was 12 when she committed the crime. When questioned about Katie's murder, Sharon fully confessed and she did not hold back. She was interviewed for around 27 hours over the course of several days where she done most of the talking. She spoke fluidly about the murder and with great excitement. She had held on to this for years. She could never openly speak about it properly. She did in kind of little hints that I told you earlier that Bullwood Hall kind of picked up on, but now she's not hiding. She's not fearing of getting caught and she can openly talk about it and she's enjoying doing it and she just can't stop. The interviewer described Sharon as, quote, being on another universe while detailing murder and Katie. In our confession, Sharon spoke about some very graphic injury details that were withheld from the public, details that only the killer would know. She also spoke about a bracelet that she had stolen off of Katie's body, which was yet another thing that wasn't made public and that only the killer would know. So these details solidified their confession. Police had their murderer and their sat looking at a child who was a cold-blooded, callous killer. Throughout all of her confession and all of her interviews, she never once showed any regret or any remorse. In fact, she enjoyed relaying the details and she would get excited and she even laughed. During her interviews, Sharon did mix up really small details. The thick of what she said happened is very consistent and very much the same, but it is just smaller bits. So what I relayed on to you earlier on, that is what is believed happened. So I'll give you an example of some of the details that she kind of changed each time she told the story. For example, in one version, the version that I told you, she said that she had dragged Katie's body to that cemetery wall alone and then left her. Police found this very unbelievable because they think that Katie's body would have been far too heavy for Sharon to do this alone. Personally, I think that they're underestimating her strength because she was strong enough to inflict them injuries on Katie that they thought a 30 year old man had done. In another version, she said that the two boys that were in the car helped her move Katie's body. She gave police the name of these boys and when they were interviewed, both of them had alibis, so they weren't there to help. And in another version, she said that the attack on Katie began when she was still in the car and it was from this attack that made Katie kind of sprint and run away. So again, very small details that she changes, but the thick of the case is still the same. Something that was consistent throughout is that she took sole responsibility for Katie's murder and she didn't try to blame anyone else. She didn't say anyone else was involved and she was very proud to have committed this murder alone. At one point, and I don't know exactly when Sharon is diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. So this diagnosis is kind of on the spectrum with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Schizoaffective disorder is split into two bits. So the schizo side of it, the symptoms of that is psychosis, meaning that she probably has experienced hallucinations and delusions. And the affective part of it refers to mood symptoms. So she could experience very deep depression and then she could also experience mania as well. Obviously this diagnosis does not justify Katie's murder whatsoever. One in 200 people have schizoaffective disorder and they are not murderers like Sharon they are just normal people. If you remember, I mentioned earlier that Sharon had been abusing cannabis from age 11. So could that have been something that kind of triggered or brought on this schizoaffective disorder? Sharon was officially charged with Katie's murder in May 1996. And despite her lengthy confession, given details that only the killer would know, Sharon retracted her confessions and went into the trial pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. The trial was held at Winchester Crown Court in February 1997 and it lasted for around about one month. The jury deliberated for only around five hours before they returned their verdict. 
on the 25th of March 1997, Sharon Carr was unanimously found guilty for the murder of Katie Ratcliffe. Upon hearing this guilty verdict, Katie's dad from the gallery jumped up and shouted, yes, he finally had justice for his daughter after almost five years. This verdict also gave Sharon the title as Britain's youngest female murderer as she had committed the crime when she was only 12. Many people confuse this with Mary Bell, thinking that she holds the title. Mary Bell was 10 years old when she committed a double murder in Newcastle. However, she was convicted of manslaughter not murder so that's why this title goes to Sharon which I'm sure she's very proud of. If you don't know about Mary Bell and you would like to hear more about her case I have actually covered that case on my channel so I'll leave a link in the description box below if you would like to go and listen to that video. At the end of the trial the judge remarked to Sharon saying quote what is clear is that you had a sexual motive for this killing and it is apparent both from the brutal manner in which you mutilated her body and the chilling entries in your diary that killing, as you put it, turns you on. You are, in my view, an extremely dangerous young woman. Sharon would go on to be sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 14 years to serve. When she received this sentence, she was smiling and as she was escorted out of court for the last time, she was still smiling. Her team have filed several appeals against this murder conviction, however, each of them have been dismissed. Sharon began her sentence at HMP Holloway, however, she was transferred to the infamous Broadmoor Hospital in 1998. Here, she continued her violent and aggressive behaviour, often assaulting staff and getting into fights with other patients. However, for a very brief time, she found love and was actually going to get married. She, who was 21, met a man named Robbie Lane, who was 24, during some very rare recreational time at Broadmoor. They met and seemingly hit it off immediately. They were allowed supervised visits to each other's rooms or cells about once a month, I think it was. And they even saved up money so that they could buy wedding rings for each other from Argos. In the days leading up to a wedding, a magazine or a newspaper had printed an article about their upcoming wedding. And inside this article, they detailed Sharon's murder and also Robbie's murder. So Robbie committed a murder. He killed his own mum by stabbing her beating her and then gouging her eyes out because he was so jealous thinking that his mom preferred his sister over him. After reading the article and learning what the other person had done, both Sharon and Robbie became repulsed by each other and were, quote, so shocked, horrified and disgusted by the ferocity of each other's murders and they immediately called off their wedding and never spoke again. How bizarre is that that these two people who committed equally heinous horrible crimes became repulsed and disgusted by each other after learning about their crimes that was just crazy to me. In 2015, Sharon, who was now 36, was transferred to HMP Bronzefield as a restricted status prisoner. This meant that she had to be held in a closed prison and that she spent a lot of her time in solitary. This transfer came after it was deemed that she either no longer required the treatment from Broadmoor or the treatment that they could provide her was ineffective. I lean more towards the treatment being ineffective because if the treatment that they could provide her was effective, why was she transferred and why was she transferred as a restricted status prisoner? In December 2018, now 39, Sharon was transferred to HMP Law Newton where infamous killer Rose West was housed for a period of time. She didn't last long here though, her violent tendencies once again arose when she attacked her cellmate with the full intent of murdering her. Back at HMP Bronzefield in 2020, Sharon had had applied for her restricted status prisoner to be downgraded. She didn't want to be considered as a restricted status prisoner anymore. However, this was denied because she hadn't proved that she was no longer a risk or a threat to kind of anyone else that she could be around. Because when she was around other people, she was still getting into fights and still causing trouble. The judge who denied this request justified his ruling by saying, quote, she disclosed thoughts of wanting to murder another resident by slitting her head open with a flask and throwing her down the stairs to snap her neck. 
definitely not the thoughts of someone who was rehabilitated. Sharon is now 43 and has spent almost 30 years in prison. The last that I could find of her was when she was appealing her restricted prisoner status. Her 14 year sentence expired a long time ago and she is now being held indefinitely until she can prove that she is no longer a threat to society and the first step of that is no longer being considered a restricted status prisoner. Some people believe that she is well past saving and that she will never be let out. What do you think though? Comment down below and let me know. Can she be rehabilitated? Does she still have time for a life on the outside? Does she deserve a life on the outside? Comment down below and let me know. And that is today's case. A case about an 18 year old woman who had big dreams, big aspirations and who had her life ripped away from her. Sharon's start in life was tough. It was traumatic and she didn't have a nurturing, loving mother to guide her down the right way of life and down the right path. So is it it's so unsurprising that she turned out to be an incredibly horrible person. 50-50 because some people have those mothers and still turn out to be really nice people. Was Sharon born evil or was it her circumstances and her upbringing that made her so? Comment down below and let me know because this nature versus nurture argument absolutely fascinates me. Thank you all so much for sitting and listening with me today. If you have enjoyed today's video and you would like to listen to even more true crime cases covered by me, I have plenty on my channel ready for you to all go and watch right now. I do also cover shorter true crime cases over on my TikTok account. I have linked that in the description box below if you would like to go and check that out and follow me on there. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a like and comment your thoughts down below. Thank you all so much again for sitting and listening with me. As I say on every video, I really do appreciate the continuous support that you always show me. So I'm gonna leave today at that and I will see you all on my next one.